Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. We are still a bit in our section on the calibration of our discrete forward rate term structure model. So the first sessions on calibration were how do we choose the model parameters to match observed financial products? And there we discussed, okay, which model parameter is actually responsible or influencing which financial product? Yeah, because then we should calibrate this um, parameter yeah, to this um, observed product. And a nice situation is if you have that, uh, you can choose one parameter to a given set and then fix that one and then move to the next parameter set. Yeah, For example, first fix initial values to the linear products and then start uh, fixing the uh, volatilities to the nonlinear products. And that was a little bit what we did here. We yeah, also tried to understand the model a little bit better by looking at uh, what are the parameters doing. For example, the displacement parameter in the displaced log normal model is creating this slope yeah, in the implied volatility uh, curve. So this was understanding the parameters, but often calibration is also associated with the problem of finding an analytic formula for the value of a financial product in terms of the model parameters. Often you cannot find an analytic formula for such a complex model. So in that case, we've tried to find an approximation. So this is what I like to do with you today. So I move here to this section. I like to find an analytic evaluation formula for our nonlinear products. No? For the linear ones, the calibration was just uh, trivial. Yeah, why is this uh, associated with the problem of uh, calibration? So calibration can be understood as you start with the model parameters and from that you calculate the model value, for example, by using the Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah? So by using an uh, expensive numerical method. And from that, you calculate the calibration error, which is the difference of the market observed value and the model value. And then you try to minimize this. So you plug this function into some uh, numerical method that tries to um, minimize yeah, or find a root, yeah, if it is a one-to-one -one mapping of parameters to value uh, of this function. So you have to iterate this function maybe many times. So Calibration is then a very time-consuming numerical procedure. And this is clearly the motivation that I like to find an analytic formula that maps the model parameters to the uh, market-observed values. So this is here our uh, motivation. So since the optimization requires many such calculation, there is a need for a fast analytic formula. And we already had this, for example, for the caplet. So caplet is easy. For some of our popular versions of our discrete forward rate model, so for example, the log normal one, which was this guy, 110, the normal one, which was this guy, yeah, or even for the displaced one, we found some direct mappings from the model parameters to 
market observed values. For example, for the log normal model, there is black formula or black Schultz formula for the value of a caplet. So I have the black formula. So this formula gives me the value of a caplet in terms of the volatility parameter sigma bar here. I can very fast, very easily invert then the market observed price to this parameter. So such that I have a market implied black volatility. And then we just had here this condition, how this black implied volatility, so this is now the guy from the model, the black implied volatility calculated from the model. So here is our model parameter, yeah, relates to this observed value. So I just need to integrate the square of my model parameter, averaged over time, taking the square root to get this parameter sigma bar here in the black formula. So I have a one-to-one -one mapping, yeah? First step is calculate the integral of your model parameter squared, yeah? divide by time, take the square root, plug this in into black Scholes formula. So you have an analytic formula for this use case by black formula and the integral of the model parameter. You can do the same stuff for the Bachelier model using the Bachelier formula. So for the normal model, so here our 111, yeah. integrate the sigma i superscript n squared over time, divide by time, take the square root, plug this in into Bachelier formula, and you have an analytic formula for the for the value. And you can also do the same for the displaced uh, log normal model using a shifted black formula. So for other models, for more complicated local volatility functions, yeah, this is maybe more difficult. Um, for caplets on other forward rates, so for example, for caplets that have longer uh, periods, you can also derive an analytic formula in the same way we will do it now for swaptions. But this is then just maybe an approximation because some correlation um, enters. And the two things which I marked here in red yeah, are maybe nice uh, exercises, uh, which you could maybe try yourself. So, for example, derive the analytic formula for the shifted log normal model and uh, also uh, try to derive an analytic formula if the caplet is not the one that is associated with our tenor discretization. So it's not the one on Li, yeah, Li, the forward rate from Ti to Ti plus one, where this is our model time discretization. Because here our model, you see, it is modeling these quantities here. Yeah? So forward rate Li. Um, so I can also uh, only calibrate analytically the caplets on these uh, forward rates. Okay, so the motivation for the analytic formula is clear. I like to have a fast uh, valuation because I think that around this, there is a numerical optimizer that is yeah, modifying all the many parameters to match the observed product. Yeah, so this could be a high dimensional optimizer. So the interesting, the very interesting part is, can we find an analytic valuation formula for swaptions? And of course, I have to make a restriction to 
under which model. Yeah? So I cannot try to find or it's difficult to find something under, under a very general model with a very general uh, local volatility function. So as we saw here for the caplet, that for our different versions of the model, there were different versions of the formulas, black formula, Bachelier formula, or a shifted black formula. So we have to make maybe a restriction on the model. And I would start, I would like to start with our log normal model. So this is our 110. Yeah? So the diffusion part here is Li sigma i dwi. So this is our log normal model for the, for the forward rate. So finding an analytic formula is possible in the sense that we find an approximation formula. And um, yeah, the calculations are a bit special now because I have focused on one version of the model, the log normal model. But the steps that we are doing here are very general. So what you learn here is really a technique yeah, that you can apply in many situations. And a little bit, we, we did it maybe, for example, when we did uh, convexity adjustments. Yeah, uh, There was also a little bit, um, sometimes this technique hidden. So what we do is we need to link a product on one underlying. The swap chain is an option on the swap to our model parameters that are parameters for some other underlying object, uh, I have a model of forward rates. So I need to link somehow swap chain, swap or swap rate to forward rates, forward rate uh, dynamic. So um, what do you know for uh, swap chains? Yeah, you know that there is an analytic formula. For example, there is black Scholz formula if the swap rate is log normal following a log normal dynamic. Yeah, then you have a black formula. We we derive this. There is um, a black formula for swap chains. But unfortunately, if forward rates are log normal, the swap rate is not log normal. Even if you say that approximately the swap rate is a linear combination of the forward rates, which is approximately true. Yeah? If you remember uh, what we did for the linear products, there was a small lemma that showing that the swap rate is a convex combination of um, forward rates, but in the weights of this convex combination, the forward rates also appear, yeah? the zero go up once appear. Even if you take this view, this is not correct because a linear combination of log normal random variables is not log normal. Yeah. Okay, but maybe we can go this route and try to link the two via some approximations. So it's nicer to make the link between volatilities yeah, uh, instead of the model volatilities and the market prices. So an approximation formula can be derived by expressing the volatility of the swap rate as a function of the volatility and the correlation of the forward rates. And our technique here follows a fairly general uh, scheme. So first find a model for the underlying for which an analytic formula is known. Example, the log normal swap rate model. So if the swap rate follows a log normal model, because then I have an analytic formula. Then I have black formula for a swap chain. So this is the first link. Um, you have now swap rate model parameter to swap chain value. 
The next link is I have to find the swap rate dynamic assuming my forward rate dynamic. So I have to link the underlying dynamics. So what is the model for the swap rate given that we start with a log normal forward rate model? So what is the stochastic process for the swap rate if I know the stochastic process for the forward rates? This is Ito's lemma. So the next step is Ito's lemma. I can write the model of my underlying, so my swap rate, in terms of my given model. Yeah, so in terms of my forward rates using Ito's lemma because the swap rate is a function of my forward rates. So if the swap starts maybe in TA and ends in TB, yeah, so two time points in my time discretization, okay, then we already know that the swap rate depends on the forward rate that lie in this interval. So it depends on LA of T up to LB, yeah, minus one, okay the front for the last period from TB minus one to TP. So this swap rate, the swap that starts in A and ends in B is a function of the forward rates. And if I have that one stochastic process as a function of another stochastic process, then Ito's lemma can tell me how this stochastic process looks like. And if I do this, then the model parameters of my forward rates will appear in the description of my swap rate stochastic process. My analytic formula is for the swap rate being log normal. I can write the swap rate under my model, under my log normal forward rate model. Okay, and then I have somehow to bring the two together to map the two. I have the problem that under log normal forward rate, the swap rate will not be log normal. We will see this, this mismatch, but maybe we can just do an approximation. So the last step is that we be a, a little bit brutal and have an approximation. And using the approximation, we can then maybe um, express the model parameters of the simplified model in terms of the parameters of the given model. Yeah. So the simplified model is the one associated with the valuation formula we know, and the given model is the one, of course, here associated with our given forward rate model, which will imply maybe a more complicated model for the swap rate. So this is a very general technique. Yeah, Think of a, a formula you know, and then try to uh, map the parameters of one model to the parameters associated with this formula. So let's start with this uh, second part, express the swap rate as um, a function of um, the forward rates. So the swap rate definition is repeated here, but we had a very nice slide earlier here. So the value of a swap chain, there was nicely expressed the swap rate is given by, okay, the value of the floating leg. So the value of the floating leg is here on top. Well, if we are in a single curve setup, recall that this here is actually a telescope sum, which is just the bond at the beginning. So this is here a PTI minus the bond at the end. This is here a PTJ. On my other slide, I use now TA and TB for start and end. Yeah, so don't be confused. And of course, also on the other slide, I have a variable time parameter. Yeah, so it is here just a T everywhere. Okay, because I would like to study the stochastic processes. But apart from that, the formula is here. Um, so you see the swap rate um, is um, expressed as this 
bond at the beginning minus bond at the end divided by the sum over all these bonds, the swap annuity. But the bonds can itself be expressed as products of one plus forward rate times period length. So you see the swap rate on the left-hand side is a function, maybe a complicated function of the forward rates. So the swap rate is a function of the forward rates. I denote the stochastic process of the swap rate of the underlying swap starting in TA, ending in TB as SAB. I allow here that the tenor discretization for the uh, fixed leg is maybe coarser. Yeah, so you can really make this uh, general. On the other slide, it was just the same discretization. So this doesn't matter. I use a little bit ambiguity in the notation because SAB is the stochastic process of the swap rate, but it should also be the symbol for this function that expresses the swap rate in terms of the forward rate. So now I have here the forward rates inside. And what forward rates do I have inside? So I have the forward rates inside LA of T and so on up to LP minus one of T. So I like to apply Eto's lemma to this function. So use now Eto's lemma. I get that D S A B, yeah, my swap rate process is yeah, actually the function differentiated by time dt, yeah, but the, the function does not have a separate time parameter. So the function does not change over time. It just depends on the forward rate at these times. So this term is not here. Then I have the first order term. So the first order term is differentiate the swap rate with respect to the forward rate. So means differentiate now this function that expresses swap rates with respect to the forward rate multiplied with the process of the forward rate DLK. And then I have the second derivative of the swap rate with respect to two different forward rates, say LK, LL, multiplied with the stochastic process DLK, DLL which gives me just a um, DT term, yeah? So if you now plug in my log normal model, so my log normal model is, yeah, there is some drift and then the diffusion is LK sigma K DWK. And if you also plug in the DLL. Okay, so you see here, you have some LK sigma K, LL sigma L, DWK, DWL. So this is a rho K L D T. So this is just an NDT part. Uh, the funny thing is I'm not interested in the DT part. So this can spare me a lot of calculation stuff now. Yeah, also notation stuff because I want to map the diffusion parameters, the sigmas, of the forward rates to the diffusion parameters of the swap rates, so the sigma of the swap rate. So I'm not interested in the stuff that is in front of the DT. Yeah, this will be right. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So nice thing is that I do not care about this part. So plugging in my log normal model. So I have here my model parameter sigma i for my forward rate process into this Eto's lemma gives me some dt part, yeah, which I do not need to consider. And then I have the first order term. So differentiate the swap rate with respect to the forward rate times the stochastic process of the forward rate. I would like to map this to a log normal swap rate model. 
So for that, I just multiply here with an S and I divide here with an S. So this is because I like to map or link it to a log normal swap rate model because if the if I have a log normal swap rate model, I have the analytic formula, the Black Scholes formula for this option. So I just um, added this uh, factor and I divided by this. So plug in the DLK. So this is an LK sigma K D W K. Okay. And then maybe make it even more similar to the log normal model. So just have the S here in front and then have my forward rate volatility here and all the other stuff should go into this, say, weight, yeah? So this WK of T. So my WK of T is now, okay, so what is it that stands there in my swap rate log normal model? So it is the swap rate function differentiated with respect to the forward rate divided by the swap rate because I wanted to make it a log normal swap rate model multiplied with a forward rate because it came from a log normal forward rate model. The funny thing is that now if you differentiate S and if you divide by S, this is the derivative of the logarithm of S. Okay, so this is the deriv derivative of the logarithm of F S. So I can write this shortly as differentiate logarithm of the swap rate. And differentiating with respect to LK and multiplying with, with LK is differentiating with respect to the yeah, substituted variable, the logarithm of LK. So you can write this weight a bit nicer. It is differentiate the logarithm of the swap rate with respect to the logarithm of the forward rate. So this is exactly yeah, intuitively maybe what you would expect. This factor there in front that maps one model parameter to the other is, okay, it's a log normal model. How does the logarithm of the underlying in the target model change as a function of the logarithm of the underlying in the source model, in the given model, in the forward rate model? So this is a weight. Yeah, we are done. What have I here on the slide? I have that the swap rate follows a log normal process because this guy here is just some, yeah, it's a multi-factor Brownian motion, but the linear combination of Brownian motions is just a Brownian motion with maybe a different volatility. Yeah, so... Um, this is just some uh, sigma yeah, d w s, if you like. So I'm I'm um, I may be done uh, if I can write this here as some d t part plus s a b sigma a b d w. Okay, superscript s, if you like. So I like to map this guy here somehow to a single in a single parameter. Yeah, you also see that my mapping is not um, really a log normal model because this weight here is stochastic. Yeah, so the weight is not a deterministic function. This is stochastic. Yeah, it is differentiate the function of the swap rate with respect to the forward rates, but inside there is still the forward rates at different times. Yeah, so this is a stochastic process. Yeah, of of its own. So the swap rate is a, is a log normal model with a stochastic volatility. But this is where the two things are not uh, exactly uh, matching. Where I have to do an approximation. So how do I get now from this to a single parameter in a log normal model for the swap rate? 
how do I get D S A B is S A B sigma S A B some single D W. How do I get this guy? If I know that my swap rate is like this, where I have here some complicated sum over multiple DWs. Yeah, this parameter here can be nicely expressed. So first thing is divide maybe by the swap rate. Yeah, so look at ds divided by s. Then you have ds divided by s has some dt part. Okay, there um, is yeah some, some complicated drift. Plus sigma s a b d w. So it is a normal dynamic. So if you then multiply this with itself, you have sigma s a b, sigma s a b, d w, d w, which is a dt. Okay, and then you can just integrate this. So the relation of this model parameter to the black formula can actually be written as we did before. Okay, so the square of the black implied volatility is integrate your model parameter squared over time, divide by the time period length. So the time average integrated variance, but you can also express it in terms of the quadratic variation. So this is just integrate the quadratic vari variation. So you could just write integral from zero to say TA, you know, the exercise of your option, the guy that you are interested in, is just integrate ds divided by s multiplied with ds divided by s. Because this here is just sigma sab dw times sigma sab dw. So this is just sigma sab squared dw dw is dt. So let's use this uh, way of expressing the black volatility yeah, squared with our representation of the stochastic process, because all I need to know in this representation is the stochastic process. So I divide here by SAB and plug this in to this expression. So I get that I have to integrate ds divided by s times ds divided by s. So I have to integrate, yeah, plug this in. So what was this from the mapping of the two model? Yeah, so this here is the sum over all forward rates, forward rates from a to b minus one. Then the weight, yeah, that linked the L to the S, so it's the WK of T times the sigma K from the forward rate process DWK. So if you now multiply this with itself, just then I have to use maybe another parameter for the Okay, yeah, so I use an L, so all combinations are multiplied. So the DWK times DWL gives me the correlation rho KL DT. So actually what you see is that you get the weight WK multiplied with the sigma K for the forward rate multiplied with the, from the second part, the weight WL multiplied with the sigma L for the other forward rate, and then the correlation. So I get the covariance of all the forward rates that are participating in this swap, the integrated covariance 
from 0 to TA, yeah, the exercise point of the swaption, the covariance weighted with some stochastic weight. So this is the stochastic yeah, log covariance, yeah, the covariance of the log processes. So since this is stochastic, hmm, I cannot use it in black schultz formula. So in order to do this, I just make it deterministic and I make it very brutally deterministic by freezing the weights in zero. So this is how does the swap rate that we observe today so in zero depend on the forward rates that we observe today in the sense that we differentiate the logarithms. So this is for example here the WK. Um, is this um, yeah, a very good uh, approximation? Is it a good approximation that we do? Think maybe back when we looked a little bit at what is the swap rate. The swap rate can be interpreted as a linear combination of the forward rates. So as a weighted sum of the forward rates. And what are the weights? If you go back to our slide where I had the forward rates, it is that the weights are given by the zero copper bond divided by the sum over all zero copper bonds multiplied with the period length. So if interest rates are low, then actually the zero copper bond here is close to one. So what you have seen have here below is the sum over all time steps is the full time period. And what you have here on top is just the time step. So this weight that you have there is approximately just how much time does the forward rate consume in the swap, yeah, in a percentage sense. And I already mentioned if interest rates are low, this guy here is close to one. So this weight stays quite constant if interest rates are not too high. So this approximation is not so bad yeah, if interest rates are not uh, too high. And yeah, maybe at this point, this remark, even if this approximation is not very accurate, so you could not use it to express really a price and then trade on this price, it is maybe a good approximation for calibration because calibration uh, likes to bring your model parameter close to the optimal solution so you could start with this approximate formula and make iterations in your optimizer to bring you closer to the optimal solution. And then in the, in the end, you can use the true solution or say your Monte Carlo simulation. So maybe something that requires much more time to make a few more iterations in your optimizer to get then the perfect result. So um, I'm not so unhappy yeah, if this approximation is not so good because there are then ways to fix this if we just look at this as a, a nice tool to improve the calibration. But indeed for, for uh, low interest rates, also flat interest rate curves, uh, there is um, uh, this approximation is quite good. Yeah, and now I have found my expression for the lack implied volatility of a swaption in terms of my forward rate covariance matrix. So I can calculate the swaption implied volatility yeah, for Plex formula. So the forward rate model parameters. I have the analytic formula. You can now calculate the weights. Okay, I have this here on the slide. Yeah, I had the nice thing that I can 
express the weight as differentiate the logarithm of the swap rate with respect to the logarithm of the forward rate. Let's reverse this. Yeah. So actually what we did, we differentiated with respect to the forward rate and we multiplied with the forward rate um, the logarithm of the swap rate. So plug the swap rate inside so if I plug the swap rate inside so, uh, of the logarithm, the swap rate is the floating lag divided by the swap annuity. So differentiating, uh, so they have the, you have the logarithm of um, a ratio. This is the difference of two logarithms. That we have a ratio becomes here a minus. Um, so differentiating the logarithm is differentiate the stuff inside divided by the stuff inside. So it means actually that I need to differentiate a zero copper bond with respect to a forward rate. Yeah. So you see, you just differentiate the zero copper bond here with respect to the forward rate at the beginning of the period, at the end of the period, and inside the swap annuity. So all I need to know is how do I differentiate a zero copper bond with, with respect to a forward rate. So recall a zero copper bond that matures in, say, uh, TK is the product Okay, of one plus L, L delta T, L. Uh, yeah, maybe the K is now not so good. So maybe I choose some other thing. So recall a zero copper bond that matures in say TI, okay? Uh, this is just the product one plus LK delta TK. Yeah, to the power of minus one. Okay, and now the k runs from zero to i minus one. So if the forward rate is not in this product, you get uh, zero. Uh, if the forward rate is in this product, so if the k is before the index that is here in this bond. Okay, then you just differentiate the product, differentiate the product. I will differentiate one guy out of the product. So differentiating one guy out of the product just gives me the delta TK, the delta TK. And then I have the remaining product without this guy. Okay, but then I put this guy in again. Okay, it is a to the power of minus one. So I put it in again if I divide by it and I have the zero copper bond again there. Okay, and this minus comes okay from, it is a, a one divided by. Yeah, okay. So you have a very simple formula to differentiate this zero copper bond. All that is happening is that uh, the zero copper bond remains there, gets a minus, and that pops this factor out here this factor exactly corresponding to the K for which you differentiate. And you get this very nice representation of uh, the weights. Yeah? So actually this is the weight here for all times. And then I just take this, this function of the zero cover bonds for today's value, yeah? for T uh, equal zero today's time. You can also express the weights in terms of the swap annuity, which is then very nice, for example, to implement this. So this is our result. I can make the result even look a bit nicer if I introduce, say, for example, matrix notation, because then you have the matrix of the integrated forward rate covariance, yeah? So the covariance matrix integrated up to time TA. And then you think of the weight being a vector, the vector of weights for your different forward rates. And then you multiply the weight from the left and the right to this matrix, yeah? So all so it's covariance out of this matrices that refer to forward rates that are inside my swaps uh, are combined with the weight WK and WL. Yeah? So if this here is a matrix, 
C, which describes your model integrated covariance, C of TA, and the weight is a vector W. Yeah? So maybe I draw something like this on top. So then you can write this here as W transposed C. W, which is a nice interpretation, yeah, because it is the covariance projected in the direction described by the weights. Yeah? And the weights describe how does the swap rate move if the forward rate move, yeah, the gradient of the swap rate with respect to the, the forward rates. Very, very nice little um, analytic formula. Yeah, analytic formula gives me here a uh, Swap rate volatility integrated, yeah, squared. So swap rate integrated variance from forward rate integrated covariance. <clears throat> this is just the remark, yeah, that I can write this in this nice matrix not notation. So the approximation that we made is that I approximated this dependency here in time zero, yeah, sometimes called forward drift approximation and um, or freezing of drift. Yeah, maybe this term is mm, a bit bit misleading. Yeah, we did not really freeze the drift. Yeah, we freeze this this um, projection vector. We can do the same for the normal model. And I have it here in the script. I just go through this very quickly. Okay, what you do, you start with the normal model and then you like to map it to maybe a normal model for the swap rate. Yeah? So I like to map it to a normal model for the swap rate using here my model parameter sigma k for the forward rate from the normal model. Yeah, why actually I did map log normal forward rate to log normal swap rate, and now I do normal forward rate to normal. Yeah, so which is a good choice for the model? Yeah, you could also try to cross map it. Uh, we had this uh, question when we did convexity adjustment. Yeah, uh, recall the CMS adjustment. There we also had this observation. Okay, for example, if forward rates are larger or equal than zero, so if forward rates are positive, then the swap rate is also positive. So there are maybe some boundary conditions that give you some intuition which model you should choose for the swap rate. So if I am, am in a log normal forward rate model, I know my forward rate remain larger or equal zero if I start with initial value larger or equal zero, so I have no negative interest rates. This means that also the swap rates will be larger equals zero. So a log normal model for the swap rate is maybe a reasonable model. If I go for a normal forward rate model, forward rates can become negative. The log normal swap rate model will be maybe not a good model because the swap rate could become negative. So that's a little bit how you could choose uh, which model to map on which other model. So what you get here is then that the weights are just not differentiate the logarithm of the forward rate with respect to the swap rate. It is just differentiate the swap rate with respect to the forward rate. Okay, then you just do the same. You express the implied Bachelier volatility in terms of using the quadratic var variation. Yeah, So integrate here the DSAB times DSAB. So now it's also not the D log, yeah? it is the DS. That gives you this parameter here. You plug in your stochastic process of S, which you got from Ito's lemma into this expression of the quadratic variation. Okay, and you can express this in the same way. The covariances of the forward rates multiplied now with the corresponding weights. Weights now a little bit different. So we have the same thing and we do again the approximation 
that these stochastic weights are approximated by using today's weights to get a deterministic value out of this stochastic uh, volatility. So, and the approximation formula yeah, looks then the same. Differentiating the weights uh, or getting the weights, yeah, it's actually just the same. The logarithm does not appear, yeah, so it's a little bit different, yeah, and you have a very nice uh, expression of the weights. If you plug in here, all you need is how does a zero copper bond differentiated with a forward rate look like? So you get these formulas. Last remark, uh, you can also do this for the swap rate covariance. So you can also try to look here, what is the not integrated quadratic variation? What is here the integrated covariance of the swap rate? Very nice thing. It is just that we have our matrix of forward rate covariances are now multiplied from the left and the right with the weighting vector. But now the weighting vector associated with the different swap rates. Yeah, So one is SCD, yeah? a swap that starts in C and ends in D, the swap rate. And the other one is SAB, a swap that starts in AB, uh, uh, TA and ends in TB. Uh, so you can also look uh, how does the covariance and by this the correlation of two swap rates uh, depend on the forward rate uh, covariance uh, structure. This is uh, important if you have, for example, products that pay the difference of swap rates. Let's look a little bit at the implementation. And there is from the implementation side um, a small remark. I have this in my multidimensional optimizer. So my optimizer will change the model parameters often and then evaluate many financial products. Yeah? So it is necessarily necessary to repeatedly calculate it, the swaption approximation for different covariances. And in such a case, you have to think a little bit, okay, what are the things in my formula that I can cache, that I can keep, that do not change often? And what are the things that, that change often? And the thing is that for each swaption, the weights need to be calculated only once since they belong to the financial product, to the swaption. Yeah. So which forward rate enters into the swap rate? Yeah, this is determining which weight I, I look at. So I just calculate the weight once in the financial product. And then in my model, I calculate the forward rate covariance structure. So um, and calculate this integrated instantaneous covariance. So the integrated instantaneous covariance needs to be calculated once per iteration. So whenever my model parameter change, I need to recalculate this matrix. So I calculate this in the model once for every parameter change, then use it in many different products because many swaptions will look into this matrix and apply their weights, but the weights are calculated in the product and um, uh, cached uh, there, and then I calculate the swaption value. So we can look at this. So the aspect is that I need a very special model. Yeah? So not all models can provide this. So I have an interface here, it is called LIBOR market model. Such a model provides the matrix C, yeah? or it was actually also called gamma. So it is the gamma IJ of TA. Yeah, so it's actually not a matrix, it's an area depending on three indices, i, j, and up to which I integrate. So this is my integral from zero to t, a, sigma i, sigma j, rho i, j. Okay, so this is provided by 
my model calculated from the model parameters of the forward rates. Yeah, these are the model parameters of the forward rates. And in the product, I then calculate the weight, perform this quadratic form, yeah, WCW, W transpose TW, um, and plug this into the Black Scholes formula. So you can look at, for example, our model, Liber market model from covariance model, which provides this integrated covariance. And then you can look into one of these two product implementations. One does it only for a log normal one, the other one for log normal and normal. So maybe let's have a short look. Let's maybe start at the product. So here are our products. You see this Swaption analytic approximation, uh, which describes the methodology, yeah, as we had it on the slide. And um, you see in the get value method, I get an arbitrary simulation model, yeah, a Monte Carlo simulation of whatever. From this, I extract the process model, and I check if I am in the special situation that I have a LIBOR market model, a LIBOR market model, if you look here into this declaration of this interface, is one that provides this integrated covariance, this triple array, yeah, the IJK, the integral from, okay, here, the indices are a little bit, a little bit different. This was a TA in my slide. Uh, L, J, L, I. Okay, so it provides this triple array. This is the integration time, the TA, and then these are the two indices of the covariances. I check, do I have a model that provides this? Then I can do the analytic uh, approximation. Other one, okay, this product requires a simulation where the underlying model is of a special type. So I have some, some type checking. So what do I do? I get the weights in this separate function. Okay, this separate function is here below. We will look at this below. This here gets the weights W and also some other quantities. I get this integrated covariance. Yeah. So I call this method. I get this integrated covariance. I fetch it already at option maturity. So I already plug in the TA, so integrate up to TA. So this is then the matrix C. Yeah, this is already my integrated covariance matrix. And then I just perform the quadratic form, multiply from the left and the right with the weights. Yeah, so W, I, W, J times gamma I, J, yeah, the matrix. So then you have the integrated swap rate variance, and you can either return that if the user would like it, or you just plug it into a black Schultz formula, and you are done. So all I need to do is I have to check here the weights. Okay, this is the function that calculates the weights. Looks a bit ugly. Okay, but... You can maybe check this. This is the formula we had um, on the slides. Yeah, so the summations also calculates other things on the fly, which which are maybe of interest for the Black Scholz formula above, so that we don't need to calculate this again. So you can also study in implementation, and this guy is really fast. So in my next section here, also related to calibration and analytic valuation, I would com like to combine now what we did in this session. I have an analytic formula and what we did in our early session on calibration, when we looked here at calibration to swaptions, we studied a little bit the dependency structure of how does the swaption 
depend on my model parameters. Yeah, that appeared already in my analytic formula, only the model parameters, only the covariances that are inside the swap enter into this formula. So there was this nice little picture here. Yeah, Only the forward rates that lie inside the underlying swap enter into my valuation and now enter into my analytic approximation formula. We had this nice table which told us, okay, the calibration of, say, for example, a swaption on this swap rate depends on all those forward rates. Okay, and since this you have this structure, you could actually then calibrate this swaption by altering this forward rate. And now I'm in the situation that I have an analytic formula that creates the relation of these two guys. Well, why use a numerical optimizer? Isn't it maybe possible to just invert this formula analytically? So I have an analytic formula that tells me how does this guy here look if I know already the other forward rates and if I know the implied black volatility of the swaption. I would like to have an analytic formula. And this is possible. And because I have this relation that I can calculate one um, forward rate volatility piece from this for, uh, inversion and then move to the next one, uh, it is a bootstrapping procedure. So I can bootstrap the whole forward rate covariance structure we will just look maybe at the volatility structure from uh, swaption implied volatility. This is a little bit diff. Uh, this is a little bit similar to what we had here for the uh, caplets. Yeah. So this is what you observe on the market for the caplet, and then this is what you have already calculated, and there was an analytic formula to then calculate the uh, forward rate volatility uh, in the model, given the thing that you observe on the market and parameters you have already calibrated. Actually, the formula will be a little bit similar to this. We have to solve a quadratic uh, equation. So this is called bootstrapping. It's a short session, but we will do it maybe next time, yeah? So that was it for today.